Yeah, one of the most compelling arguments that I give to people is, listen, I wish we would live in a world where like you would have trees that magically create hospitals yes. or magically create schools. Yes. Then shit would be free. Yes. But the problem is if you want free stuff, the only two ways to get it are slavery, yeah. where you don't pay people for their job. Right. And I don't think any of us want to go back to that. That's right. <laughs> or plunder and yes. robbery. Yes. The only pacific, uh, peaceful, sorry, alternative for robbery and slavery for free stuff mm. is the markets. Yes. It's voluntary trade. Yes. It's the only one we have so far. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the corruption of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and Thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard, hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start uh, a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money Show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm going to do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Gloria Alvarez, welcome to the What Is Money show. Robert Breedlove, thank you very much. Muchas gracias. So nice to have you here. Uh, we're in Memphis at the Freedom Fest mm -hmm. 2023, yeah. surrounded by a lot of freedom lovers. And just by way of quick introduction, you are a presidential candidate for the country of Guatemala. Yes. And you're also a director at Liberty University, which has been recently launched, I think, in Mexico City. Correct. Um, wow, that sounds like <laughs> quite the accolades you got there. Um, Thank you. How did you come into this? How did you come into candidacy for presidency in Guatemala? So the short answer for that is that I am fed up with always conforming myself with the mediocrity that we have in the right wing and the mm. left wing in Guatemala for decades. Mm. Uh, it's basically, now that we were talking about Atlas Shrugged and then mm -hmm, Rand, mm -hmm. it's like Atlas Shrugged in its prime, you know? Mm. And we, as libertarians, we're always criticized, at least in Latin America, for being too utopian. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, oh yeah, your ideas are good, but on paper. But you libertarians, like you never get in the, in the, in the dirt, you yeah. know? And for years, I first denounced socialism mm -hmm. uh, regionally, and then I tried to ally myself with the right wing of Guatemala mm -hmm. until I found out that there was a lot of cronism, mercantilism, mm -hmm. not a real interest for free markets. Right. So I just came to the conclusion, and why should I wait, I wait for others to get convinced about liberty mm -hmm. when I already have everything that that is needed to present a coherent government plan. Mm. So that's what I did. I went online and I said, listen guys, you know me since forever because I've been doing radio, mm -hmm. so people know me in my country. Here is my presidential plan. Mm. Whenever you want it, it's here for you. And I did 15 steps 
okay. five that are non-negotiable. Like if you vote for me, I'm doing those five things. Yeah. And those include the demonopolization of the currency. Great. That's one most whip. important thing in the world. Super, super yeah. important. And then I have other 10 for people to choose five. Mm. We can talk that uh, later, but yeah. That's so fascinating. So you, I, you told me the story offline of how you came into the public sphere. Yeah. Of you going viral yes. on a speech that you gave that you didn't even know was being recorded. Yes. <laughs> so it was what, insane. Tell me that story and then tell me what the content of that speech was and yeah. how it impacted your life. Sure. So I think that everything in life, uh, it's a mix of opportunity and preparation. Mm-hmm. And then something happens right. and, and, and things spark. Yes. Uh, there have been things in my life that have been not only my control. All I have done, and, and thanks to a family that have always supported my education, because mm. they are communist uh, runaways from both Hungary mm. in my mom's side and Cuba in my dad's side, mm-hmm. they always taught uh, my brother and I that the most important thing is whatever you have in your brain, because mm. that's the only thing that no dictator can seize from you. Right. So right. if right. it's time to run, at least you have your brain. Right. So I grew up in a household where education was very important. I move around a lot. I live in El Salvador, in Honduras, because of my dad's work in uh, a sales manager. Mm -hmm. And when I was choosing university, I always wanted to be a lawyer uh, Mm. because I love to defend people. You like to argue. Yes, (laughs) also. And ask questions, you know. like what my mom always said about me. She's like, you're going to be a lawyer because you like to argue. Exacto. She's kind of close. Yeah, exacto. (laughs) But the thing is, being a lawyer in Guatemala is not like in the movies. It's super yeah, boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like being in the in the computer, yeah. like like looking at paper yeah. all day. I didn't want that. Yeah. And then I go to this uh, fair of universities, of colleges, and I go to UFM, yeah. which is the libertarian Disneyland that some of your yes. audience might know, yeah. right? We have the Mises Library, the Hayek Auditorium, yeah. all of that. And of course, I knew that communism was bad mm-hmm. because of my family's history. But that doesn't automatically make you a libertarian. It Mm -hmm. just makes you an anti-communist, right? right? Like my obsession with going to Cuba, I always would ask my grandma, why cannot we go to Cuba? And she would be, are you crazy? There's a dictator there. Mm. And he does these things. And she would explain everything to me that George Orwell, you know, says Mm -hmm. in Mm -hmm. Animal Farm or whatever. So the thing is, I, they, they say in this UFM booth, there's this career, international affairs, never heard of it. Mm. But I read the contents, philosophy, economics, history of the Western civilization, mm. history of Africa. And I'm like, I'm in. Yeah. I love this. Right. So I go back home and I say to my parents, I'm studying international affairs. And they're like, what do you do with it? And then like, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know, but I love it. <laughs> and so I started in university. And then I started learning about Hayek and Mises and free market and public choice at Lucky Bastia. You. Right? Yeah. But if, if it would have been another university, like most Marxist universities, right. who knows, right? right? Keynes and, yeah. Keynes yeah. and uh, uh, giving wealth away yes. and the government knows better right, right, right. and all of that. Yeah. But the thing is, I was always questioning also the free market ideas because mm-hmm. I was not quite convinced. Sure. I was like, yeah, you're telling me that if, if only we have free markets, every, everything is going to work? Like, no. And actually, the ideas of liberty for me were more philosophical. Mm. When I read about the psychology behind being free means that you are the agent of your own life, mm-hmm. and that means responsibility, the, yes. the ability to respond. Yes, yes, yes. I said, oh, okay, so free markets follow. Yes, You know. yes. And then I became a super advocate for these ideas, but I thought that they were very utopian. Right. You know, like how can you implement that in a country like Guatemala? Right. Because UFM is quite known more broadly than in the country. And then another stroke of luck. I had friends in a music band. Okay. And one of them, his father was bringing a radio to Guatemala, a commercial radio, pop music and such. Mm-hmm. And they were looking for people to be uh, broadcasters, but he didn't want the normal broadcasting, like communication uh, uh, students. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He wanted people that were studying other things. Mm. And so a friend of mine recommended me and they called me like, do you want to work on radio? And I'm like, radio? 
But I'm in international affairs. Like, it has nothing to do one thing yeah. or the other. But it was great. It was a three-hour uh, daily job. It, it, it helped me financially to, to my independence, uh -huh. you know. And I had so much fun because yeah. I love music. Yeah. And it turns out that thanks to those two things, many years later, after I do an internship in the Cato Institute, I study in Marxist universities, I go back home, I get invited to this Congress in Spain, I give a speech, boom, goes viral. One million views in three days, and that changed my life completely. One million views in three days. And yeah. what was the content of that speech? And how did you not know you were being recorded? You were just giving it and someone... No. I knew, I knew that it was going to be recorded, like it was recorded. Yeah. I didn't know that they were going to put it online. Ah, okay. I thought I was like, you know, like the regular yeah, yeah, cameras, yeah. Right. whatever, but not that they were going to like, like put it online yeah. for other people. Right. Okay. So when you see me speaking there, I'm just talking to the people that are there, yeah. you know, yeah, not yeah. to like the world, yes. you know. Yes. And uh, so a Cuban uh, prisoner, a uh, victim of communism and a guy from Venezuela, had asked for the floor before uh -huh. me, and they say, well, how come nobody in Latin America is denouncing the horrible things that are happening? And of course that started, you know, like picking up my blood because I know from that. So I started like writing bullet points. I asked to, to talk and I said, listen, everybody, we need to use technology mm -hmm. to dismantle these populist lives because these dictators are presenting to the world that there's healthcare and that there's free education and that right. there's this. And it's all bullshit. Yeah. So we can all be our own journalist. Yeah. And we need to also understand that the right wing has done it so bad in Latin America mm. that this is why people choose more socialism. Yeah. That was the basics of the speech. If you ask me, I didn't say anything that hasn't been said before right, right. by Rand, Bastiat, Mises, yes, Hayek, yes, yes, Friedman. Right. But I don't know. Well, you said it in the right way. Yeah. Definitely struck a chord. And that's what an amazing story. And that so that propelled you into the spotlight. I think you said you yeah. came to the office yes. Monday with <laughs> I was quite in, the surprise. I was in the beach, right, uh, in a weekend. And I go back to the office, you know, business as usual. This, this uh, Congress in Spain had happened two months ago mm -hmm. uh, before. This was 2014, almost 10 years ago. And I enter my email. And I have like 3,000 emails. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got hacked. <laughs> you know, that was my first uh, reaction yeah. to it. And then I got a phone call from Argentina. And as I told you, like, of course, I knew Europe. I knew the States. Yeah. But I've never traveled southern from Nicaragua. Everything okay. I knew about Latin America was because of my studies, yeah. my friends. But I've never geographically been anywhere yeah. there. Yeah. And I get a call from Argentina, a media a outlet called Infobae. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, we're, we, we want to talk to you about your viral video. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Your speech. And I'm like, what speech? Go on YouTube. And I go on YouTube. I will never forget. And I see my face in a channel that is not even my channel. <laughs> and it's like one million views. And it had been uploaded three days before that. Wow. And I'm like. Oh, okay. Wow. What a pivotal moment in your life. That's yes. That's incredible. And it's, it sounds like you're saying, too, that you're just saying the truths you had learned from your studies yeah. about the nature of free markets, individual sovereignty, etc. Uh, this always brings to mind the old Nietzsche quote that everything the state says is a lie. Everything yes. the state has is stolen. Yes. And it sounds like that's the most succinct version of that. But we have these dictators around the world... I call them romantic lies. They're yeah. always telling you, oh, free health care, free education, whatever, which belies the truth that the government can't give you anything for free yeah. because everything it has is stolen. It's yes. coming from someone else. Correct. So it's very, there's another saying in business, if the product's free, then you're the product, right? So Correct. it's something about piercing that veil of romantic lie bullshit that every statist across history has promulgated on the people to yeah. confuse them and let them steal their shit. So, yeah. so I get very passionate about this. So it's very cool that you were able to break that down. Yeah, one of the most compelling arguments that I give to people is, listen, I wish we would live in a world where like, you would have trees that magically create hospitals yes. or magically create schools. Yes. Then shit would be free. Yes. But the problem is, if you want free stuff, 
the only two ways to get it are slavery, yeah. where you don't pay people for their job. Right. And I don't think any of us want to go back to that. That's right. <laughs> or plunder and yes. robbery. Yes. The only pacific, uh, peaceful, sorry, alternative for robbery and slavery for free stuff mm. is the markets. Yes. It's voluntary trade. Yes. It's the only one we have so far. Mm -hmm. Maybe we will come with a new one once the aliens arrive in right. many centuries. Right, 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 I hope right. so. But those are the three alternatives. Either we enslave people for free stuff, yes. we robber them and then yeah. it's free, yeah. or we have jobs and we trade peacefully. Yes, mutual consent, yeah. right? It's it's so simple and so obvious when you actually apply your, your intuition and your mind to it, yet yeah. many people have the wool pulled over their eyes by those engaged in legal plunder, right? Yeah. We want to paint this socialist utopia from each according to their ability to each according to their need. It's yes. like it's just a veneer for me to steal your stuff effectively. And yeah. Um, it's a very hard thing to talk about, though, because people get very polarized politically. Yeah. And um, this is a, not a political issue. This is a practical economic reality. Yep. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high-res 3-inch touchscreen. It's got a camera for air-gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI, UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, the Gold Investment Letter. The Gold Investment Letter helps sophisticated investors navigate capital markets and maximize their profits in trading gold, silver, and mining stocks. The Gold Investment Letter seeks out the most undervalued companies and identifies special situations in the mining sector and then provides in-depth analysis on both their financial positions and future prospects. The Gold Investment Letter explores many complex domains, such as investor psychology, portfolio management, and macroeconomic trends, all with the goal of making you a better investor. The Gold Investment Letter offers a free version and a paid premium version, and I strongly recommend you at least sign up for the free version, because after having read a few of these issues, I can promise you it is a treasure trove of good information. You can sign up for the free newsletter today at goldinvestmentletter.com. So, um, okay, you mentioned you studied at UFM, which yeah. is a free market university in Guatemala. Correct. I've been talking to them, uh, plan to come visit. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like at free market university? Because when I was on a video call with them, they were showing me the statues of like Mises and Hayek and yeah. these libertarian <laughs> superheroes. Yeah. What, what is it like down there? It's amazing. First of all, it's one of the most beautiful campuses. And I studied in Europe. I studied in Georgetown. It's one of the most beautiful campuses in the world. Uh, it, it, it's a beautiful mix in nature and technology. But uh, on top of that, it's a place where you're passionate about studying because you really are in, in a place where you want to read more. You want to learn more. Everything inspires you to, to be the best version that, that, that you can be. And you would ask, why in the world, from all the countries, Guatemala? So the story is that this uh, engineer, he was half Guatemalan, half Swiss. He's always puzzled with why Guatemala is so poor. If, if the people in your audience have been in my country, mm. it's one of the most beautiful countries in the planet. It has all the natural resources, a lot of microclimates that can breed almost any fruit, mm. any vegetable, any kind of bird. Like we can... We can harvest everything that we need for a healthy world, yeah. right? Plant medicine, etc. So he was always asking himself, why is it that Guatemala is so poor? Mm -hmm. And in the quest of finding answers, he comes across Leonard Reed's Eye Pencil. Oh, uh, one of the best essays ever written. Yep. Yeah. And, and that brings him to learn more and more and more, 
until he meets Mrs. and Hayek mm. and he decides, I have three options. Either I do a newspaper to spread these ideas, mm -hmm. I do a political party, or I do a university. Mm -hmm. From the three of them, the hardest was making a university mm -hmm. because then you're thinking on the long run. Right. You know, like you yeah. are going to start changing the minds of the young people yes. so that maybe in the long run, we have new generations of yeah. freedom fighters. Yeah. And he chose the hardest one. Wow. And he did UFM. And he did it in a part of the city, which is like a canyon mm -hmm. that was worth nothing. It was super cheap land because it was like, like this. Yeah. So he brought architects and engineers that would have the vision of making the university in the semblance that the Mayans that are also mm. located in Guatemala would do their buildings in the jungles. Wow. So that's why it's a delight because you're in the middle of nature with an architecture that it's it's part of it, wow. you know? Now that land is worth a lot of money, yeah, you know, because yeah. it's one of the most beautiful uh, campuses in the world. And there were a lot of Americans noticing how American universities were going to the left yeah. that started financing UFM yeah. as, as a, a jewel that they knew was not going to be touched. Wow. Yeah. And how effective and when, so when was the university completed? Um, Did it start? 50 years ago. 50 years ago. Yeah. So how effective has that long game been of, the, of planting the seed of these ideas? Has it permeated Guatemala? Has it changed things? Like, what has the impact been? So it's it's in one side, yes. Thanks, for example, to uh, Manuel Ayao, who was the founder. We established a law in, ni in the 1990s where the government cannot print money mm. every time that they pleasely want. This has prevented Guatemala from having the massive and crazy inflations that you see in Argentina. So the law is still in force? Yes. Okay, wow. Of course, every politician wants to change sure, 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 the sure, sure. power. Yeah. But that has prevented that. Also, we have a radio, Libertopolis, uh -huh. that was founded by alumni from UFM okay. that spreads the ideas of liberty on air. And uh, also other legislations that would have pushed Guatemala into a more socialist path yeah. have been prevented because of that. Wow. We are one of the few countries that has not been governed yet by socialism of the 21st century. Mm. But unfortunately, we have had corrupt right wing yeah. that people are so discontent with that, of course, socialism can be an alternative, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, so, and so you studied there from what age to what age? From 17 to 22. 17 to 22. 2003 to 2007, yeah. And then you got the degree in international affairs? Yes. That what it's called? Okay. And political science. And political yeah. science. And then you go to study, uh, so I think you did internship at Cato Institute. Next. I did, okay. yeah. So I was looking for a master's degree. And in the between, you know, like the classes starting in September, I applied to Georgetown University with a program called the Fund for American Studies, TFAS. Mm -hmm. And I applied to the Cato for an internship. And I said, if I get either or, I go to DC. Mm -hmm. And I got both. So, okay. yeah, so that, that was a big savior because uh, with the money that I was earning in the Cato, I could like sustain myself. And with the scholarship, I had like the board and, the, and, and everything covered. Yeah. So I was there for six months and I loved it because it was the first time that I saw the ideas applied, mm. like how the Cato would be always you know like nagging the democrats and the republicans every time mm -hmm. they would be against liberty mm -hmm. in different subjects environment economics yeah. social issues yeah. uh, be it and that's where i grasped the how to be more pragmatic yes. right because like ufm gave me the academy right but not that much like the the pragmatism right right, right, right. the philosophy is coming down into practicality exactly yes, okay. and be more like an activist yes. right like going to protest i remember one of my first protests was with Tom Palmer. He's one of the most amazing teachers I've I've had, and he's uh he's like the James Bond of libertarianism, you know, like okay. fighting for liberty all over the world, helping political prisoners in Africa, in Asia, everywhere. And I remember the Egyptian government had incarcerator Karim, uh, which was a student fighting for women's rights. So we went to the embassy of Egypt in D.C. with the Cato, and I remember like like having a. Um, how you say like a poster or a yeah. banner saying like seriously dude just free him please <laughs> like that. yeah it's amazing yeah. so then 
you saw then so you've got the philosophical backing at UFM. You yeah. then see get the practical experience, I guess, at Cato Institute. Yeah. W- then you go to Europe I to go study. To Europe. Okay. Yeah. And obviously different uh philosophies yes. reign over there. What was where were you studying? Yeah. Um what how did these ideas conflict with what you had learned previously and, and how did that shape? Yeah. You? So so I was tricked into Belgium. I, I studied in the Catholic University of Leuven that then I found out was the 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 place where um they bred the theology of liberation, which was when the Catholics went socialist in, in Latin America, a cr- uh, crazy thing. The thing was that I went to Belgium a year previous uh, for a seminar uh, of the IES Europe, which is the Institute of Economic Studies in Europe, mm-hmm. with amazing libertarian professors like Pierre Garello and Carlo Lottieri. So I got the impression that Leuven University was also a free market oriented university, thinking that UFM was more common than actually what it is, right. you know? Right. And I applied there as my a backup university. I applied to other universities for masters, NYU, American, Columbia, Brandeis University, and I wanted to study in the States. Uh, I wanted to focus on international development. My aim was to go to the UN or the World Bank or IMF and change their minds from within, you know, like explaining to them why free markets, trade, not aid, are the solution for the undeveloped world. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, I didn't get a scholarship on any of the universities. I got in NYU, for example, in Brandeis and other universities, but they didn't give me the money. Uh-huh. And I didn't have $50,000 <laughs> for, for studying. Sure. I didn't want to get in a student loan, and I am so grateful that I didn't yeah. do it because yeah. now I see a lot of people struggling with that, and yeah. it's, it's sad. And Europe was cheap. It was like 1,000 euros for the entire year. Wow. So my dad told me, listen, I am, I am sorry, but I cannot pay for, for yeah. college in the, in the States. And I was like, that's okay. I'll go to Europe. Yeah. And it was one of the best things that I could do because all my professors were socialist anthropologists, mm-hmm. Marxist, mm-hmm. with this white guilt about the horrible things that Europe did mm-hmm. in Africa, mm-hmm. but blaming capitalism for it. Right. And I was like, that's not capitalism fault. Right. That's what colonialism, like when, when the state with monarchies yes. controls the economy, yes. that's what happens, yes. right? So it was a great experience. And then I studied in Rome and I worked with Senegalese immigrants, which also broke my heart. Because uh, that's where I, I was absolutely convinced that what we need is liberty. I, I, will, I will never forget a Senegalese immigrant. They, they sell in Rome a fake Chinese bags and purses yeah, of uh, yeah, big yeah. brands. And he said to me, listen, what I hate about Europeans is that they're so hypocritical because they say that they want to help Africa, right? And there comes Bono from U2, let's save Africa or the concerts and they give money to UNICEF or whatever, Oxfam, you name it. But when I come to this continent to work, and my money goes straight to my family with Western Union or whatever, they want to kick me out. But the money that they, um, um, how do you say, uh, donate, goes straight to the dictators that are making impossible for my country to grow, in this case, the Senegal. So what is it? Do you really want us to, to thrive or not? And that was like the final drop that I needed into saying like, yeah, it's liberty. Liberty Liberty's the answer. Yeah. Well, have you, did you ever read the book Confessions of an Economic Hitman? No. I think you'd really enjoy it. Um, I read it this summer and he, he, it was a guy that worked inside of the, the international aid business and he described just that. There's nothing, there's no aid to it. It's financial slavery, basically, right? You're trying to, the dictators get rich, the population gets fleeced, and a lot of wealth, the economies get re-engineered and the wealth flows back to the economies that the World Bank, the IMF represent, which yes. is pretty much the United States. Like, yes. um, it's a giant scam and sham. So, yeah. that also the work of Alex Gladstein. He's yes, a prominent Alex Bitcoiner. Gladstein. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. The Human Rights Foundation. He's great on all those topics. So. Exactly. And Magate Wade, who was also Magate here. Magate Wade, yes. I love her yes. to death because I did my thesis on 
criticizing this in 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 Belgium. Yeah. Of course, they never let me graduate, which yeah. now it's an honor for yes, me. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> but then many years later, they did this documentary called Poverty Inc. Uh -huh. And it was basically my thesis on screen. And I was like, I'm so happy. Wow. And I learned about Magate and her amazing work. Yes. And, and it's great because what we need is trade, not, not aid, you know? Yes. Yeah. yeah, we need trade, not aid. That's a great, great thesis. Okay, a lot of these, I mentioned to you, Atlas Shrugged. I'm about 85% of the way through the audiobook right now. It's a 64-hour audiobook. It <laughs> it's takes, a 1,000 more pages. I have reading. been listening to it for probably two and a half, three months, you know, like yeah. an hour a day here and there. Um but all of these ideas that we're discussing, I have never heard them so eloquently captured yeah. in this fictional fictional yeah. narrative called Atlas Shrugged. But as I'm as I'm going through this audiobook and I'm looking at what's happening in the world right now, I'm like, everyone needs to read this book. Exactly. Like it, it explains everything verbatim what's happening. Yeah. When did you you mentioned you read Atlas Shrugged yes. early on too? Yes. How how did it shape you? How did it impact you? So the first time I opened Atlas Shrugged, which in paper, like paperback, it's like this is small. Yes, uh, it's like a uh, Bible. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I read the first page. I was in second year of college, and I remember not getting any of it. I was like, this English is too elevated for me yeah, right now. Yeah. So I left it there. And when I was going to Rome, uh, and I was packing my bags, I said, all right, I have no no space because back there I, I didn't know how to pack properly. Now yeah. I can do, you know, three <laughs> weeks in one carry on. Yeah. But back then it was like, you know, the big bags. And I was like, OK, let's be real. It's going to be four months of studying. I have, you know, a work with the Senegalese immigrants and all of that. Let me take one book. Yeah. So I read that one book and I took Atlas Shrugged. Mm. And because my English has gotten better, in Washington, mm -hmm. in Belgium, etc. I just got hooked yeah. in and those those four months in Rome while I was living the experiences yeah. that I was living. Atlas Shrug was my company, and I was like, "Oh my God, this woman, she is brilliant because she mixes sex, family, self-esteem, yes. uh, politics, yes. economics, uh, struggles, yes. philosophy, all in one place. Love, morality, yeah. ideology, yeah." I think it spans everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And yeah. and the thing is, it also for me was everything my Cuban grandparents mm. taught me about how they decompose a society. Yes. And you can see it there step by step with every regulation, yes. how they start, you know, like uh, uh, making obstacles for Dagny yes. to have a better company on trains, right. how her brother uh, wants to please the politicians, mm -hmm. which is always what happens in Latin America, mm -hmm. even with the crony businessmen, right? Mm -hmm. like, like they say, well, you know, I know he's corrupt, but let, let's let help yeah. him because he's our corrupt yes. instead of having another right. one, right? Yeah. Yeah, that it's that incremental decay, right, from yeah. capitalism through socialism into just ultimately like a communist society. Yeah. Um, how did that, from there, did that change your trajectory? Did it amplify your, your love yeah. for liberty? Like, what was the... Totally. As like, you completed it, how did you feel? I, I felt, first of all, compelled to, like, spread this message to the world. Yeah. Second, I was super convinced that if I would go into the international aid, not aid, yeah. uh, world, I was going to be miserable yeah. because I would be part of those moochers and looters. Right. Uh, like uh, Hank Reardon's brother, yes, yes, such yeah. a hypocrite yes. when he asked for the check and then he said, yeah, but I don't want it with your with your name because then they're not going to want it. And yeah. that's what I was living and experiences yes. with these guys that are like with the white guilt, but they want the money from the people right. who created it, right? right? So I go back home to Guatemala and I have an existential crisis. I was 25 and I was like, what do I do? Yeah. I have two cum laude BAs. I have three postgraduates. I have a master's degree that I never graduated because of the thesis. I have all this knowledge and I don't want to be part of any of it. I don't want to be wow. in a political party. I don't want to be in an NGO. I I, I don't want to be part of anything. Yeah. And so I went back to radio. I went to visit my friends in this uh, commercial pop music radio. 
And I was like, hey, guys, how are you? How's life? You know, like just yeah. like visiting everybody. And the guy who had stayed in my uh, shift, uh -huh. he was now in another radio called 949, uh, which is the cool music radio in Guatemala okay. because that's the one that plays like the English hits. So okay. if you are a broadcaster in 949, it's like you made it. Okay. You know, it's like the cool, cool radio. Yeah. And I was like, really? So now Luis Pedro works in 949 and he's like, yeah, it's just across the hallway. And since I didn't work in the radio anymore, I could go to, you know, the competition. Mm -hmm. And so I went like, hey, is, is Luis Pedro around? And they're like, yeah, yeah, he's on air if you want to go and, and say hi. So I go in and he says to me, hey, what are you doing these days? And I'm like, nothing, man. I just came from Europe. I am super disappointed. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah. And he's like, well, there's a, there's a free uh, slot here from 9 a.m. To, to midday because the, the girl that was here, she, she left. Yeah. Uh, would, you, would you like the job? And I'm like, sure, yeah. let's do it. Like, I love yeah. music and I love this station. And so I started, yeah. you know, like talking about what do you talk normally on, on commercial radio, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, uh, the gossip of Hollywood, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. And then one day my boss calls me and he's like, Gloria, you have all these studies. You've been here and there and mm -hmm. like, what the hell are you doing working on my radio for $200 a month? Because radio is super badly mm -hmm. paid in Guatemala. Yeah. And I'm like, well, the thing is that I'm frustrated. I don't want to be part of any. Yeah. And I started explaining and he's like, I want that on air. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, I want these ideas on air. And I'm like, are you sure? Because we're going to piss off a lot of people. You They're, wanted this, the, your studies, your story? What was it? He, was he wanted the libertarian ideas ah, okay. out there. Wow. He wanted like, I want you to talk about everything that you know. Mm. And like your mind, who is Gloria? That's mm. what I want on air. And I'm like, okay, but it's going to create a lot of hatred. And he's like, I don't care. And so he, now I have the challenge on how to present these ideas to young people who don't give about anything, yeah, yeah. just music, yeah. you know? Uh, and we had this uh, text message um, uh, situation because this was 2010. Wow. So social media was not as big as it is right, right now. And so if you would get 1,000 text messages during your shift, yeah. you would get 100 quetzales extra. So okay. like $10 extra. Yeah. So all my colleagues were always offering stuff through the text messages, like say, I have a photo of Paris Hilton in bikini. Send me whatever and I'll send you the picture, right? So I was like, okay, what am I good at? I'm good at getting scholarships. Mm -hmm. And so I started saying on air, listen guys, the government is not interested in educating you. The government wants you stupid because the dumber you are, the easier it is to get your vote. Yes. So you have two options. Either you... Um, go and study for yourself and you make your mind your own or you stay in this mediocrity yes. waiting for the government to change. Right. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a CoinJoin. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make CoinJoins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state-of-the-art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Casa. Casa makes it simple to buy and secure your Bitcoin without wondering whether you're doing it right. Specifically, Casa provides a multi-key custody solution, which is by far the most secure way to custody your Bitcoin. Now, when I talk about Bitcoin being theft-proof money or inviolable private property, a multi-key custody model is exactly what I am talking about. Using multiple keys lets you maintain full control of your Bitcoin while also giving you redundancy in case you lose one of the keys. 
It's also the best way to secure your Bitcoin for inheritance planning purposes. So go to keys.casa, that's C-A-S-A, today to sign up and use discount code BREEDLOVE. So I have scholarships here. I have a scholarship to study advertisement in Australia. I have a scholarship to study medicine in Spain. I have a scholarship to study engineering in India. If you want the link, send me the text message with the word scholarship, beca in Spanish. And my program just skyrocketed, you know? Wow. Yeah. So people were interested. Super interested. They were super interested in self-development. And then I started you know, like giving courses, online free courses, like everything that would be for the development of young minds. And that's how I learned that uh, freedom of expression is possible as long as you have rating. Because when you have rating, the media will let you say whatever you want, you know? Really? Okay. So if you're getting viewership or you're getting audience, then freedom of expression tends to be supported. At least that was my experience on on air in Guatemala, because until that point, all the broadcasters thought that they had to stick to Hollywood gossip or superficial things in order to, you know, maintain their jobs. And I came to prove that that was not true. Like you can also have really good content to this day on that radio they still offer scholarships that's amazing and i think that's great yeah yeah it's almost like uh the uh, the audience is being underestimated i think we saw this too before the podcast revolution yeah. you know on mainstream media it was always these like five to seven minute sound bites yeah. it was assumed that the audience didn't have an attention span more than that of a goldfish yes. but then we started to get into the digital age you have like streaming services People watch Game of Thrones. Yep. Oh, this is going to really interrupt us. They're popping balloons as they close down. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, people start watching Game of Thrones for seven seasons, right? Yeah. So people have very long attention spans. And then you get into podcast world where people listen to these three and four hour podcasts focused on self-development. So it's interesting how that changed the assumptions about... Yeah the audience. Yeah. So it sounds like you, you saw that as well firsthand. Yeah. And and it's all like trial error, trial error. But it, you see, like the more I talk about like my life story, one thing I always transmit to people is, yes, there is a part that you have to do, but it's also about taking the opportunities and also people who have trusted me, you know, because I do what I do because I also have the amazing opportunity. Now I work with Ricardo Salinas. Mm. He's big on Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. He's one of the most uh, admirable businessmen in Latin America in the sense that he's not apologetic about defending liberty as a whole. Yes. Not, not only the parts that are convenient for him. And because of that, I can do what I do. But I also understand that if there's no market for free minds, and people that can support the things that you and I and others are doing, then I would dedicate myself to, you know, like uh, boss tables or or doing something else, you know? Yeah, and to take it back to Alice Shrug, the source of all wealth, right? It all starts in the mind, and um, that's something you have to defend that as such. It's not just yours or anyone else's. It's defending the principle of liberty itself. Yeah. So it's it's a beautiful thing. You are now running for <laughs> yes, president. I am of Guatemala. I am. How so this seems like maybe the culmination of your journey so far. Like yeah. wh- what what propelled you and encouraged you to do this? Yeah. And and when? Like when does this happen? What is the sequence? So after I got viral, uh, I started working in a national civic movement in Guatemala, mm-hmm. funded by the right wing, mm-hmm. and I thought that we were actually doing very important work. We did a lot of um, scandals in front of the Congress. We would go and protest Mm -hmm. with piñatas of cockroaches and rats, like saying, like, we need to, you know, like, uh, gas this Congress and put new people because it's all full of crap. But when the media would cover us, we would be like, this is the public policy that we want to implement, always in the the favor of of freedom, right? But the problem is that that civic movement uh, also started funding or aligning itself with crony right-wing candidates. And that's where I saw that it's not only that Latin Americans vote for socialism, 
is also that the right wing is not free market. So I stepped out of that. And throughout my career, I've been criticized, as all libertarians are, by being like, well, yeah, but your ideas are too utopian. Yeah. They're not realistic. They're not pragmatic. And I've been listening to this forever. So on the past elections in 2019, I launched my first presidential campaign with one video. And I said, this is the most environmentalist, uh, libertarian, super pragmatic presidential campaign because it consists on only one video. I'm not going to go pollute your town with a lot of advertisement. I'm not going to uh, do populism, giving you food away or any of that. Here is my proposal. My goal in 2019 was that my name started being associated with presidency. And I and I managed to do that, you know, like I, I, I inserted the conversation with that sense. And I started, you know, uh, presenting some ideas that no candidate was presenting. Now, in 2023, uh, the Constitution of Guatemala says that you have to be 40 in order to run. And I'm 38. But, you know, that's no big deal. I, I will hit 40 if no one hits me first. <laughs> <laughs> but the other issue is that independent candidacies are illegal. Uh -huh. And creating a party in my country is super corrupt. Yeah. There are more than 35 parties. The oldest of them doesn't even have 15 years. Mm. They don't have ideologies. They're just like this marketing agencies to promote dictators, you know? Right. Right. It, it, it's a joke. And I don't want to be part of it. Uh, and now with my presidential campaign, my aim was to get invited to a presidential debate because there's no law that would forbid me from that so that I could question all the candidates and their lack of government plan. Unfortunately, things are so bad in Guatemala that there were no debates. No debates? No debates. And in the first round of elections, the annulled votes were the majority. Now, this blew my mind when you told me offline. When you say annulled votes, you mean people went into the voting booth and just... Scratched their vote like... I don't want any of you. Some people even voted for me, like Gloria for president, and they would screenshot and send it to me. Some people just put like, you're all crap or whatever. That was number one. Wow. That speaks volumes to how fallen apart the system has become. Exactly. Yeah. So why no debates? Was this, they stopped the debates? Like whose decision is that? That is civil society not being organized enough or backing candidates that they know cannot stand a debate. So it's it's a joke. I was with contact with the president of the uh, press, uh, La Cámara de, de Prensa, the, the Chamber of Press. And I was like, Silvia, when are debates happening? And she's like, Gloria, we invite them and they don't want to come. So nobody wants to organize them because if, if, even if you invite them, they don't show up. So I was like, this is so sad. And now we have a second round on the 20th of, of August and the two left-wing parties are presenting themselves. And I'm questioning because there's one of them mm -hmm. that says, we're different from the rest. And I'm like, how so? Show me. And I go in a specific topics in education. What is it that you're going to do in health, in security, in justice? And now if you go to my social media, you will see that most people say, all right, Gloria, fine. We don't know what their plan is. And, mm. and I'm like, okay, then don't say that they're different. Right. Because they're always the same. The lesser of two evils, the yeah. same logic, you know? Wow. Yeah. So what's next then? What's next for you? What What can we do to help? Like what? I'd love to. This. I'd love, okay. <laughs> Come to Mexico. Okay. Let's have a, let's have now uh, me interview you in the Universidad de la Libertad. Okay. Keep uh, spreading these ideas. Keep spreading Bitcoin. Finish reading Atlas Shrugged. Yes. All of that contributes. Uh, my aim is uh, to make a, a independent candidacies legal in Guatemala for the next elections. If that happens, I will absolutely run. Uh, and I will need all the support of all the people in Latin America, in the States, in Europe that have some time heard of me to help me spread the word. And let's let's make Guatemala free for once, <laughs> you know. Um I'm going to write a book. I, I've written three books so far. I want to write a fourth book uh, called How to Defend Liberty on Social Media and Not Kill Yourself in the Attempt. It's a book I would love to read. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's a difficult line to navigate. Yeah. And I want to talk about my experience in social media since the beginning 
which it can be a little bit obsolete because I started in 2010 yeah. and the the spectrum now is different. But I want to talk about how difficult it is to, uh, being a woman, libertarian, because nobody defends you. Right. When the right wing attacks you, there's no left wing defending you and, and otherwise. And we have seen libertarians becoming part of the right wing because it's easier. You have people that protect you and this horrible right wing like Bolsonaro, Meloni in Italy that are anti-free market, anti-open borders, anti-individual liberties that are not doing anything for, for liberty, you know? And I want to dedicate that book to everybody that has uh, killed themselves for uh, cyberbullying since the beginning of the century, you know, and, yeah. and talk about this issue that I think affects freedom fighters because you can be brilliant at knowing the ideas, but when you expose yourself, you got to be prepared, you know? You have to have emotional intelligence and yeah. breathe love. <laughs> yeah, you need the emotional intelligence, thick skin, I think, because, yep. you, like you said, you don't have any defenders. You're kind yeah. of just... You're sticking your neck out there on behalf of the human species, in a way. Yeah. But somewhat paradoxically, there's not a lot of people... Like, I get messages a lot. They're like, thank you for what you do. I'm a huge Bitcoin proponent, huge freedom proponent, but I don't say anything. Because I work inside of this organization, I'm scared what my boss might think, or I might lose my job. Or... Yeah. So there's a lot of people that are in fear. Yeah. And um, hopefully this type of work and this discussion can help thaw them. Yeah. Right? We need to live in freedom and in love if we're going to create a good world. So yeah. thank you for thank the work you, that Robin. you do. And thank I wish you, you all the success in Guatemala. I hope to see you as the president down there. That would be thank so you. cool thank to so have much. a president on my show. Where can people find you on the internet? In social media, I'm in Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok, YouTube, Telegram channel, everything uh, like Gloria Alvarez uh, or Gloria Alvarez Presidente. You type that and, and I'm there. Uh, I am my own bot. I, I control my own social media. It's been like that since forever. I also want to talk about that in the in the book. Um, I and, and it has been my great teacher, you know, also. Uh, debating with people and interacting there so yeah wonderful gloria thank you so much for doing this uh, it's lovely you. to meet you it was lovely to yes. meet you as well what a great conversation yes thank you so much <laughs> bye